Hey everybody, it's Ben at CUT. I am just phoning in to uh, make a couple comments and to respond to some questions um, that I had. Um, Aaron Prophet's doing a lot of really important work and research right now regarding the mall lawsuit, the lawsuit that was brought by the former uh, rancher. Uh, royalty time retreat resident actually that's a good question did he live there I don't know if he lived there or not I know that he uh, planned for them and to the best of my knowledge I just skimmed it really quickly um, I think he, he spent he put up maybe 30 grand or so of his own money up front that was the allegation and then the project fell through and he felt that he either wasn't properly compensated or he wasn't properly compensated. In fact, he sued for a lot of money. I think it was over a hundred million dollars. Could have been like 50 million or 100, 150 million, something like that. And CUT eventually settled out of court for I think one or two. I'm not really that positive, but I won't be able to get to that information in advance of relocation out of here. Um, but I did want to bring it up because it might be of interest to people. I had. A question posted by a reader on YouTube. I have a small YouTube following. Um, actually, Ascended Master Paul of Venetian, I think, gets the most traffic now, which is a Facebook account. And I have a small following of people on YouTube, which I prefer it that way. I think it's fine. If I had a thousand subscribers, I'd be able to offer more products and services. And I don't have a thousand subscribers yet. They changed the policy a while back, unfortunately. Um, but uh, as far as the ranch is concerned, I just want to get my opinion out there. Anything to do with, con I, I, I don't question controversy as much as I am, well, I do question controversy when people speak to me in terms of CUT being quote unquote controversial. Um, so, and I entirely support Aaron's work, um, and have varying opinions, certainly, but I, I do support um, the dialogue. However, in my experience, my, and my impression is that when people speak about quote unquote problems at CUT, they're really referring to something else. And a friend of mine in the UK the other day got online, was chatting to me, messaging to me and, and asked that I be the person who really says how, it, how, how things go as opposed to the guy who makes a lot of encoded references. In law practice, that's also, people do it in, in church and they also do it in um, the practice of law. Um, you say one thing and you pursue one path and, and you're, what you're really doing is you're trying to generate momentum and you what you want is a result on another path or on a, a parallel path. But to achieve that result, you're focusing on a narrow topic that maybe is not the broad topic or maybe not even the goal. Um, but you're focusing on a narrow topic in order to try to generate momentum. And I understand that as practice and it can be effective. However, there comes a time when people actually do need to hear the reality, the lay of the land, if you will, um, from someone who knows and, and who's, who's been there. As far as the ranch goes, what I don't understand is how all, if there is such mass disconsent, discontent regarding Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Um, that is actual discontent and not just discontent as we see it playing out in the media. Um, or as we see the media trying to take advantage of it as a potential news story. Where are these people? If she was such a horrible person who was out to manipulate and control, where are all the people who were hurt? Um, I do see a few people complaining online periodically, but I also see a, a mass of people who claim to have benefited or who appear to have benefited from that aegis, the protected aegis. So I understand the community. I understand the, um, the desire to build that location and to have pe people move out to Montana. I know what it does. It, it reignites the mother flame. It's not just let's drag people out into the middle of nowhere in order to soak them. Uh, first of all, um, that's not how it went down. I can guarantee 
that's not how it went down because I know the profit legacy well enough to understand what the motivation was. I think people are speaking in those terms periodically. But there are a couple of remarks with regard to that that I would like to solidify. One is, every the reality is, Oprah, all these media outlets that are saying, isn't this bizarre, isn't this strange? Elizabeth Clare Prophet was, you know, a... I, I believe from a fairly modest family, a middle middle class family from the East, Eastern United States, who became involved in a very powerful religion with a very, you know, um, impressive guru, Mark Prophet, um, and uh, they built a religion. Not it didn't spring out of nowhere. It was actually based upon a, a lineage, and um, I guess I am was a bit what you would say. Uh, to be quote unquote odd, it was a different religion. It's it's somewhat idiosyncratic in that um, it's Christian, or it can be viewed as being Christian, but also incorporates elements from different paths. It's a syncretic religion. So ultimately, CUT really is more is structured more like a Hindu church, and in a Buddhist in a Buddhist temple after a fashion, although it's Christian as well. So people see it, and if you look at the criticism, on even by articulate people, they, they, they draw on on the fact that there's, you know, a K-17, or, or we also, in addition to Christ, we also um, invoke the powers of uh, Sonic Kumara and Lady Master Venus and so forth. Well, Sonic Kumara is, is an actual figure in Hinduism. So why call us strange? Because we're part Hindu, in other words. It's not really fair to pick on an NRM. Um, it's, it's that's not fair, in fact. It might be interesting to take it apart. That And I agree with doing that. I, I agree with deconstructing it, certainly. But for a large group of the U.S. population to believe that somehow Elizabeth Clare Prophet was out to, I don't know, dump out the savings and the personal resources of all these people. I don't believe that's true at all. I don't believe that people were suckered. I don't. Um, I think people moved there when they could um, out of their own volition. And, you know, if people are disappointed and, and if some people ended up being disappointed, that's a possibility, I suppose. But they need to be accountable for their own decision making and their own willingness to buy into the presentation that this homeland is going to help. They chose out of their own free will to to move. Um, and nobody was forcing them to do anything. I can guarantee that that's true. Um, so I support the community because it's true. It's like a new Zion for certain people. First of all, in order to understand the community, you have to understand that we're not all made cut from the same cloth. This is a biblical fact as well. And I think Pure Land Buddhists and the wisest of the sages in uh, acting uh, today, w working in the world today, understand this as well. That, you know, um, gurus, really good accomplished gurus work as manus to a certain extent. They're like manus or mini manus. And by that, I mean that they're the heads of root races. What I would like to do, rather than focus on all the ranch controversy all the time, is to read Aaron's new article on Madame Blavatsky. I don't know how new it is, but I saw it advertised. And the root races, because I'm sure that contains all sorts of fantastic information. I couldn't quite nail it down on academia.edu last night, but I will look for it again and try to try to read it. Um, it's really difficult for me to operate from here, however, and I really need people to understand that this is not a good environment. People who care. I have some very um, positive friendships uh, with individuals who are spiritual or not spiritual, various levels of, of experience within the church and so forth. And that's my one message is that um, because I'm in holy orders, I share, I share karmic burden with the rest of the people in the church. Um, and uh, a guru has really... For instance, Elizabeth Clare Prophet really took on a lot of karma for other people, and that's the whole point of having a central figure, um, is that person is, is holding the balance. So let me just be clear that 
I, and I've explained it elsewhere, and I won't get into the details, but when pe people come to me and say that they're not interested in, and they don't know anything about the law, and, they, and they're not lawyers, and so they can't help, I have to question that. Um, obviously, people have their own life path and so forth and, and must proceed diligently. But to say that everybody is on the same page and everybody's at the same level of um, uh, that everybody is karmically identical is inaccurate. And I think that the people who need the assistance in the church ought to be receiving the assistance. And the, but, the, but the guru or the people in holy orders periodically are actually holding too much karma. They're, they're balancing too much. And it's not a question of I'm just simply going to release that karma periodically. It really is a question of other people within the church or other people exterior to the organization coming in and assisting that one individual. And then it frees up all this extra energy to actually help. Um, so when I dedicated myself to the teachings of Mrs. Prophet, um, I realized that I was actually helping to balance her karma as well. So the more the church is assisted by way of these people who are holding, quote unquote, too much karma, um, the, the better off everyone will be. Not just let's, let's make sure that the top is solidified, but let's try to bring up the people who actually need it because we are all going to benefit um, within the Sangha if everybody is, is supported properly. People aren't being supported properly right now, and I'm not pointing fingers at all. Um, and uh, it's, just, it's just a fact, and it's also karmic law. So yeah, Elizabeth Claire Prop. So, so that's what one point is, it's hard for me to do anything for anybody from here. Um, and there's crime, there's money missing from, you know, from my personal coffers that would support a move out of here that would pay to restore my driver's license and so forth. So it's not a really a great situation for me personally, and it's incredibly hard for me to work. That's still the case. Um, and it really is, you know, I have these friendships where we have these long, elaborate conversations and, and they're interesting and they're supportive. But ultimately, nothing will really change until there is progress um, towards relocation. And again, that kicks in a lot of these karmic principles to actually move someone in my position um, to a better land, if you will. And that's the whole point with the ranch, incidentally, is that, is people who have suffered severe trauma and loss, um, I'm one of those people, I, I don't mind admitting it, I... I, I, I hope people understand it to the best of their capacity and also allow me to be a person alongside everyone else. Um, but the reality is that's, that is true. Um, you know, people who come back from foreign wars and so forth, who have extreme foreign, extreme exposure to stress and that sort of thing are, they become karmically different and they're because their life path has been affected sometimes permanently. And the, the, the goal is to, you know, enable those people to um, recover in the way that they see fit and in, in the way that is karmically proper, um, which is not force and coercion in healthcare, obviously, but um, uh, enhanced self-directed spiritual practices. Let's put it that way. Um, so the ranch is really important because those people who are chilas, who are very knowledgeable people, very wise, but also affected by trauma in their own lives and also in the lives of, of the people around them, need to reignite that mother flame. And the, and the because the mother flame is extinguished by trauma, um, or it can be. The ranch provides the, the actual land um, and the way in which Mark and Elizabeth designed the, the coil, if you will. Um, it, it actually provides, uh, it, it's, it, and it really is Zion, you know, in the biblical sense as well. Jews, at, at, you know, needed a homeland. I'm not, and I'm, again, I'm not saying that it's the homeland as it necessarily appears in today's world or as we read about it in the paper. But, and, and other, other groups have needed homelands as well. But because of the, the karma, it, it's, it's a fact. If there's a lot of trauma within a community, it's a fact that that community needs to be a community and sometimes a separate community. And I'm not saying 
It's based on phenotypical race. What we do in the world is we say, you're racially different, you're racially different based upon, I don't know, um, exterior manifestations of quote unquote race. It's not about color. It's actually about trauma. It's actually about needing to heal within a community and where you are in terms of round and which root race you belong to and which sub root race you belong to. So Aaron's work is really important in that regard and the work of Madame Blavatsky is supremely important. I would also uh, mention Steiner and all of that um, as well. Uh, and uh, her, actually, interestingly, Helena Blavatsky has a slightly different take on root races than I do. So it'll be interesting to see what Aaron develops or has developed. Um, so, correct. So I need to move. The, the most sensible thing for a people exterior to me in the church uh, to pursue, in my view, is to help to facilitate that because it'll just vastly assist the healing process for many, many people. Um, but as far as the ranch is concerned, correct. I don't, I understand why it's controversial. I understand why the media enjoyed it. But my opinion, when people ask me, the woman asked directly on the, my board the other day, what is your opinion of Aaron Prophet's work? Well, I support Aaron Prophet's work. Do I think that people moved out there and were built? No. Do I think that people moved out there and were brainwashed? No. Do I think that brainwashing is an issue in today's world? Yes. Mind control? Yes but it manifests itself through unlawful usages of locked wood facilities in this country. That's the truth. That's the danger that nobody wants to address directly. It's not mother's fault. If there's dialogue about abuse and mind control, I just believe it should be properly contextualized. That's all. I think it's time for people to talk about the origins of mind control um, in a way that doesn't single out NRMs as the big evil. I have a real problem with people who say that it's really new religious movements and quote-unquote cults destroying the country when the reality is there's a huge disconnect between human rights laws as, as administered by the United Nations. And the United Nations does have sovereign authority at a certain point when the U.S. fails. And the U.S. does fail constitutionally. And the White House, the UN has all of this valid information. The White House doesn't act on the information. And so torture within the country is propagated because nobody wants to pay attention to the UN. So that's the problem is the disconnect between what's actually going on with mind control. And in my view, um, the, the accompanying problem is that religions are scapegoated for, for problems. Now, religions, trust me, are not... Um, entirely without, um, shouldn't be cleared entirely because there are enormous problems with the very large religious groups in the country. But the large groups, um, it's, a, it's possible to have a, a sangha that is properly oriented, and I believe that's what CUT is. It, it does have problems, sure. Um, it, it does have, uh, it's very difficult to enter the church. It is you know, it adheres to some outmoded methodologies, I believe, but it is, in my world, many times more properly oriented than a lot of the very large churches who are unfortunately caught up in things like force and coercion in healthcare, including the Catholic Church, including here in Gardner, Maine. The Catholic Church is in bed with the state of Maine, and the state of Maine doesn't uh, support human rights standards or habeas corpus. So that's dangerous. But was CUT doing that? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. And I think that if they had known and um, they would have incorporated the effort to stop force and coercion into their practice and into the underpinning of the church. And I think that actually has happened. And I think that it's in the process of unfolding because of my work and because of, you know, other people's interest in and the evolving dialogue. So my opinion is very roughly stated. I think it's great to, to, to discuss NRMs, yes, but I also think it's important to identify the broader overarching cultural problems. Um, 
it's interesting that Maul sued over mind control, but I don't think that... Is it possible that someone felt, I suppose, extremely disadvantaged or injured? It's possible. But as I stated elsewhere, it's also possible that other people are holding karma in a way or holding the balance in a way that puts the church in the spotlight when, when what really should be in the spotlight is broken government, in show fascism. That's my whole beef and that's my whole um, march, if you will, effort is to stop overreaching healthcare practices and so on because I was personally injured injured by it. And the church actually is the only thing that that, that really helped me to survive um, because, you know, other other functions, if you're, again, if you've been very seriously injured, sometimes the life path has been affected too. And so people either don't recognize it, can't intervene, or, some, you, know, you know, in my instance, the police were actually involved. So that's no good. You, how, how would you rectify that if it without there being a church to try to support a victim of something like that. Also, when, when government breaks down, church takes over. And that's important to know as well. So it's important that church is handled equitably. If I had a complaint to make, it wouldn't be about, should we establish a homeland? It, you know, I think that we should establish a homeland. It would be, is the church allowing the people in who need the church because the government isn't functioning? It's not fair to exclude people. And because the church is at CUT, if it's pure land and everybody is making an exodus or that's that's part of the, the path, then this means that there are people who actually need assistance because they need, they need to be able to um, raise the kundalini and they can't on their own if they're out in the field injured and broken. And again, this is the resolution is either properly functioning government that is not at the inchoate stages of fascism or an organization like church. Yeah, friends friends can definitely help, but it's incredibly hard, I think, for people to work with that on, on from from a from a point of weakness. It's hard to reach out to friends if you don't have if you don't feel that you're going to be believed, if you don't feel that they're going to take your problem with the urgency that it requires, and so forth. So church is very important. Um, and a valuable tool, uh, and it shouldn't be exploited, certainly. But I don't. Again, I don't. Um, I don't see a hundred families who say that they were robbed blind. Um, and what I do see is Oprah and some other people having made a big deal about the exodus and and the and the popularity of Mother, and the buying out of, you know. Uh, Rajneesh in Oregon. She bought all the equipment from the closed camp there. Um, and, um, you know, it's a spectacle, but it's, it's supposed to be a spectacle as well. The other thing, let me address this quickly too. Land use. So, the bomb shelters. Why don't people understand the point of bomb shelters if They're instructing people. It's not mother who's making the, the proclamation that the world is going to end and explode. Not really. I mean, if you if you read the 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 pearls of wisdom, which are styled after the Zen master teachings and so forth. Yeah, periodically there are quote unquote. Um, they're not apocalyptic visions. Um, I'd have to. It. They. They. They're the masters speak in very extreme terms or in very. Um, definitive terms at times, and I don't think if you have context for it, it's not at all frightening. It's just how they it's just how they talk, um, and um, beware of the false teachers, so and so, with quotes from John. But CUT did publish a disclaimer that said that Mother never supported an apocalyptic vision. It was right there on the on the site. So the the church's official position is that we've never said that the world was going to end. Um, yes, the world ends in certain ways, certainly, and some of the world ends 
to promote growth. Certainly, that does occur. But um, Elizabeth was never one of the pastors who said, if I don't get $100 million by the end of next week, God said that they'd strike me down. There have been pre pastors like that on television in the past. Um, I, 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 it might be fair to characterize them as fundamentalist, and it might not be. But um, that was not her, her bag. So I wonder sometimes if maybe people think they see, a, a, this is what I believe occurs, they see a religious leader and they, they pack into that image all of the, um, the awful or refuse from um, what narratives to which they've been exposed and they assume that the same thing is going on. So, charismatic, well-spoken spoken lady that everybody calls mother um, says, let's all move, and people do. Everybody automatically assumes that it's Jonestown. Everybody automatically assumes that um, it's something supremely negative because that's what they've been taught. And really what it is is, a very, is the proper path. You have a, a bunch of injured people in the field. That's what you do. That's, that's how to resolve the problem. Why? Because the fallen angels have infiltrated you, including at the municipal level, and are basically micromanaging the realities of a second class, a second tier, second tier citizens. It's totally inappropriate for there to be a diaspora of CUT people if they're being hurt out in the field. So that's, that's why I fully support Montana, and I think it should be um, I think it's great, you know, to, if people can make it out there. The question is, some of us don't have anything to sell in order to move out there, so that's a problem. And that's when that's when um, it's time to speak in terms of who's going to be the guy or the gal um, at RTR who says, okay, I know this family wants to move, needs to move, or I know this person in Peru has problems with visa, or we need to facilitate immigration, that sort of thing. Those are that's what should be going on presently. Um, but so this is good to have dialogue. Very loosely stated, I want to, I'm trying to think, I have a couple of new friends. One of them is also a Jungian, as Aaron is. I've used Jung, Carl Jung, in my work before. And um, I don't want to say that Aaron is simply Jungian either. That's not, I don't think that's accurate, but she does speak at the Jung Center and she does know a lot about about Jung. Jung was a symbolist and um, I'll have to give you the passage when I wrote my, my thesis on ufology I, I used I used Jung because he was really good at looking at things like um, isn't it odd that certain certain I don't know, um, events play out in a way that resemble other events, or um, events play out in a way that is meaningful and synchronous, if that makes sense. Nothing really seems to be random, in other words. That's also a mother mother belief, that there's really, every everything happens for a reason. There's no randomness in the universe. No luck, in other words. Which can have a drawback, I believe, um, but her point really is, right, if it's happening for you, it's happening for a reason, and that's a good lesson for people to understand. Um, and, um, but, you know, I, I think that what isn't true necessarily in all of that is that people reincarnate based upon what they did in a, in a, in a previous reality that they no longer remember. If you're, if you're in a bad position, in other words, in this life, in this round, wherever you're living right now, it's really either because you were interfered with by the fallen angels or you made bad karmic choices. Those are the two options. But, it is, but there, are two, there are two causes there. And some people who are very... I, what, I, what I don't like to see is people who are suffering have other people say, well, it's really your fault. What, what did you do? you know, fix the problem, when in reality, it's really not that person's fault, it's really the fault of a fallen angel presently in embodiment, or someone who has a fallen angel in them or over them, having oppressed that person. That's where justice comes in. That, that's a, that's a, you know, a seventh ray 
issue that's a Porsche issue. People need justice served, um, and they need to see that they're not going to be hurt again. There, there's a notion at the UN called non-recurrence, um, where the really good lawyers at the UN, the human rights lawyers, want guarantees of non-recurrence. I have never had that. Nobody has ever presented, I've never achieved that ever. And people wonder why I'm not out married in the street pursuing a career and so forth. There's never been a guarantee of non-recurrence. So um, that's, that's a huge problem. But getting back to Jung. So Aaron speaks in terms of the shadow. Yes, there, there's a shadow over CUT. I'm not saying that it's CUT's fault or even generated by Mark and Mother, but I, I personally believe that it's, co it's collective anxiety projecting onto a source that is potential, potentially helpful to people. It's really what CUT is. It's a potentially helpful, a, a potential source of solace and even direct assistance to individuals. But there's a shadow over it because people do need help. And I don't think that I don't think that's enforced necessarily in um, the minds of some of these people who claim to be discontent, or the minds of the media people spinning it. They'd rather just say, "Horrible thing to happen, so misguided to move people out there, so sad about the bombs, all of that." Well, the bomb shelters aren't really a sad um, unfoldment. But as, and I'll, I'll get back to that as well, but as far as Jung is concerned, right, Jung is one um, approach. I think, you know, Freud really influenced um, theory profoundly, but there are problems with Freud as well. And Jung, Freud is a, is a forebear of Jung. So, you know, Freud came up with some things that were inaccurate, and yet they make they make sense in his own world. And but pe and people buy into them and say, "Well, you have all this trauma; it's because mom and dad were not treating you the right way at a certain level of development." There might be some out kernel of truth to that because you need do need to to heal the memory of your childhood to an extent. Everybody needs to heal memories. Everybody needs to process memory in a way in which you're able to put certain images into the purifying flame and to move forward and to benefit from the renewed alchemy. Um, that's that's true. But it's not the entirety of the story either. I'm not saying that Erin says this at all, um, but she asked me to comment upon my exposure to theory as a critical theory as opposed to Jungian analysis. Um, so my impression is, and see, Erin rescued Jung for me because I was so... I was put off by Jung at a certain point in my college education. Aaron can work with it in a way that is, it opens up dialogue and it expands consciousness around a certain topic. That's what I like about how she uses it. Um, it she uses it in a way that is transformative. So that's a plus to me. What I would add to it is that another way to look at it is through I don't want to say Marxist lens because people are under the assumption that if you are a Marxist theorist that um, you support communism. That's not true. I mean, the Marxists also influenced thought, but what the Marxists understood was that um, it's not simply about our uh, collective unconscious or our, I suppose, childhood programming or the potential effects of childhood programming or um, the possibly oppressive effects of certain forms of exposure and imagery, but rather, um, and it, that does cross over, does cross over into, into Marxist theory, but I don't want to use the term Marxist theory, I want to use the term critical theory, because what, what critical theory understands is that it's also about labor and um, and politics. In other words, rather than say that this this church issue is going to destroy us because nobody can get a handle on um, their subconscious, or people are going to feel that their world is being rocked 
in a manner that I could potentially be rocked according to the symbolists, which is, is this oppressing me uh, personally and how do I get through it personally? It's also about, I, I think that might be fair, a fair characterization. I'll have to revisit that. But it's also about politics. Who's in power, in other words? That's what critical theory, that's, that's the mission, I believe, in critical theory and certain forms of Marxist theory. If, you know, um, who's, in, who's in power and what, what's actually at stake politically, not because it's interesting to talk about it as the overarching problem and to hold it at a distance, but because it actually does have direct impact on individuals. So in other words, what I'm interested in is all these people move out there and then are grandly disappointed, allegedly. And yet other people probably needed to be out there who couldn't make it out there, who never received the help. And nobody talks about that set of people. So the way it's set up is that ranch, this is the equation. And again, I'm not making assumptions about, I know that Aaron supports her parents' work. Um, and I, and I believe that this is actually part of her message is that, right, the way we said it and, and, and part of her comment, her, her consciously executed commentary um, is we set it up to be that the ranch is this bad, horrible thing and how unfortunate it is and how we all need therapy now um, because of our exposure to Mrs. Prophet. Well, the reality is the people who are hurt by therapy are actually still in the field suffering like purple heart wounded veterans that nobody has rescued and they could really benefit from the ranch including the religious elements of the ranch for reasons relating to personal transformation and the restoration of the balancing of karma so my position is that they didn't go far enough um and that it was you know it's it's an incomplete project that's the, that's the tragedy is that the project is incomplete not that, you know, so when I, I do take, I, I don't take offense, but I do take it a bit personally when people say, and I, would, I have to give props to Erin for mentioning this as well, when she says, tongue in cheek, yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of therapists, like, why don't you see a good therapist? She said that at, at, the, at the Houston um, conference, um, and she was appropriately cynical about it which i gave her props for that um right like don't don't say because someone is in pain and it, here here's the thing the equation the formula is is incorrect if you believe that i'm in cut i'm in a lot of pain then the rejoinder is why don't you leave the church but see that the formula there is weak because you can be in cut and be in pain and still need to be in cut that you're in pain does not mean the pain is caused by the church that's where it all breaks down for me, as where people don't don't acknowledge. Sure, people at church are often hurting. That's why they're in church, you know, a lot a lot of the time. Or that there's something that needs to be resolved. That's why they're gathering um, in a formal religious setting. So, you know, there are a lot of people in pain who are Jewish. There are a lot of people in pain who are Hindu and so forth. And it's not necessarily the religion that's that's causing the problem. Oftentimes, it's the government, as a matter of fact. So... With all this talk about atheism and, and let's let's blame it on God and let's blame let's try to shut down the churches. Take a look at the government. You know this whole Trump thing aside. Um, take a look at what people must confront on a daily basis just to survive within the United States. It's a tall order. It's an incredibly tall order. No wonder people resort to church. So that's that's the biggest and I, and I I think that. The, the Jung Center talks are getting to that, definitely, and I think are inspiring it in a very catalyzing way, um, you know, the dialogue. But I think that, um, right, like people at CUT who are suffering and in pain are not necessarily suffering because of mother. As a matter of fact, many could be much worse off in the absence of spirituality to get them through. But spirituality, it's a very powerful, it's a very powerful tool and it, it does have to do with requalifying personal alchemy. It's not just, um, let's think our way out of this or, or let's pray and decree until we've raised the mood. It's actually, how do we cleanse all of these bad contracts? How do we force, if you'll look, permit me to use the term Satan out, how do we get rid of the, the influence of the fallen angels and so on? So I think mother was a real reformer when it came to religious education and Mark Prophet before her as well. 
you listen to, you know, family designs for the golden age and inner perspectives and so on. She made a lot of very trenchant points about how it is that we fail as a culture um, and why. And um, the great thing about CUT is that you want to get to point A and you're here over at point L or P. Um, you hear the steps that you take in order to, to make that transition. And you will see the result and the benefit. It is true. So, uh, you know, and I also, you know, I'm not an expert on the symbolists at all. Um, you know, I obviously have problems with modern psychology as a critic of uh, psychiatry and a litigant against psychiatry. But, and I don't know that, for, you know, as I said, like, what it's not that you can't use Jung. It's that. I, I, my belief is that you need to analyze one to really deconstruct the ranch. You need to look at what's at stake politically, as well. Um, and um, that what that will do is it'll show you that there are different classes of people. That some people are are more affected by the labor issue than others. There are people working for the church who aren't compensated by the church. Um, there are you know, and what what does that mean? Like, is that, is that okay karmically in some instances, or is it entirely inappropriate? That has to be analyzed. Division of labor, all of that has to be understood. Um, so, and let me give you an example of where I would go with that. I'll tell you about this, this man, Frederick Jameson, very well-known Marxist critic. And again, I don't know anything about his personal philosophy, only that he's referred to as a Marxist critic or commentator. But he took apart the movie Jaws. Um, and actually, I recommend this to Aaron, too, because his that paper um, includes both. It's actually called Integrating Archetype and Ideology. OK, so there's the difference, I guess, um, if anybody is following following that. Aaron's talking about archetype, which, as I said before, um, I know Aaron has huge broad understand she's a PhD and a professor I know that she understands these points already when you have and you have theory over here which is ideology this is what James Frederick Jameson said you know one of the top tier political theorists in the country you have archetype on one hand and ideology on the other hand and so in this Jaws paper this paper on the film Jaws he is trying to bridge the gap between those two schools of thought if you will um, so I suppose as a counter, it wouldn't be a counterpoint because it's really already great, complete work, what she's doing, but I would bring, I would try to bring ideology into it, I suppose, in order to expand the conversation. Likely she already has, and I believe that it's implicit in what she's doing. It's subsumed within the discussion of, of archetype for her, I believe. But, okay, so Jaws, the film Jaws. Um, there's also a play by Ibsen called, is it Ibsen? Enemy of the People, who wrote Enemy of the People? Or Shaw? It's Ibsen, right? It is Ibsen who wrote Enemy of the People. Here's the thing about it, and this is directly relevant to the CUT discussion and to Aaron's work. Um, Enemy of the People is a play that concerns someone who witnesses uh, a tragedy in their town. I believe it has to do with pollution or with um, something to do with the land not being arable. I don't quite remember, but there's a reason for it. It's one of the factories or something um, has destroyed farmland and is basically destroying the community. Um, someone speaks out about it and there's a consequence because the political reality is that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't within a community under certain circumstances because labor and personal property and so forth is affected if one bad guy corporation is destroying it for everybody else. And what people talk about are jobs. So in other words, enemy of the people, that uh, meme, if you will, is when someone, a whistleblower comes out and says, you can't do this anymore because it's destroying all of this, all of, the, all of this, um, people aren't, are, are dying 
So you can't be dumping the poison into the river anymore. And then the community says, no, don't tell us that because now we don't have jobs. Right? So what do you do? What's what's the solution? That's that's the the conundrum when people refer to enemy of the people scenario. So I'm writing a paper that is going to be a revision or an update to the Jameson paper on Jaws in which he integrates archetype and ideology. Why? Because Jaws, if you think about the plot line of Jaws, is really an enemy of the people scenario. What happens is that Brody, the out-of-towner from Massachusetts, the rich kid, comes in and says, wait a second, you have a rogue shark out killing, who's already killed this girl, and there's also a missing boater and a dead dog. Um, you know, they find the body of the woman on the beach, and you're going to keep the beaches open? And the mayor says, well, yes, because we need the revenue. Everything else will shut down. We'll, we'll, all the businesses will tank if we don't keep the beaches open. And Brody says, what are you going to do, serve them up a smorgasbord? So really, what Bro Brody represents the guy who wants to come in and do the right, the quote-unquote right thing, even though it's the economically difficult thing, and even though it's the economically unpopular thing to do, it's really a public safety issue. Um, that's ideology. That's Marxist ideology. That debate. I, I need to do this, and how is it going to affect this group of people? It's very practical. I'm not saying, and again, I'm not saying that the communists win in that all the time either, and it's possible to be a conservative cultural critic and a conservative commentator. But really with Marx, Marx isn't even, they're really just, that's just the, it's not, um, I agree with the left or the right, it's that Marx was concerned with labor. And even conservatives understand Marx's point about labor and, and politics. So, g government and so forth. So, what Jameson said was, right, you, but you also, and here's, uh, you also have this shadow, quote unquote, using Aaron's terminology, Jungian terminology, the shadow presence of this shark, this who is really um, encapsulating all of our cultural fears, lurking under the water. And, you know, the symbolists say, well, the water is really the subconscious and so forth. And yes, that's true as well. Um, but the I ideology, that, that, that point is... Um, also well taken is the whole the whole point is you can't have you can't have a, a beach open with a rogue shark in the water because people are going to be killed on the beach and as much as that might be economically unpopular uh, for you to close the beach you have to do it because it's public safety you can't have the factory dumping the poison into the river poisoning all the drinking water and killing the children even though jobs are protected the factory provides jobs so that's enemy of the people that's you know was Ibsen um, and that is part of my point about critical critical theory ideology. So right, the paper is called Integrating Archetype and Ideology. Um, and the, the update I would add to the Jameson is that it, right, it, but it's not even, it doesn't just stop at the economic debate. Um, in my, my additional work, it would also look at Quint, who was the ship captain, who goes quote-unquote crazy at the end and doesn't care that um, they're going to lose the boat, doesn't care that the engine is going to get burnt out and strand them all. He's just pursuing the shark heedlessly. And that's based on his own originating trauma. He survived, I think it was the downing of that ship where U.S. military vessel in either Korea or World War II where most of the men died because they were devoured by sharks. It was actually the sharks that got them after the boat went down there, blown up by whatever enemy. And then most of the deaths were because of the sharks, the, the downing of the ship having occurred in shark-infested water. Quint survived that. He was one of the people who saw his friends devoured in front of him. In other, in other words, so that's another uh, point to unpack with both archetype and ide ideology. What does that mean? You know, um, and uh, wh why is it that this group of men are on this boat um, in that debate? And so you can look at, at, well, who represents what on one hand, but also what, um, what it actually means that 
this poor town, for instance, is not going to get any assistance whatsoever unless they listen to the Massachusetts rich kid that nobody wants to hear out because he's not very adept socially and he's not, um, uh, his re he has odd resources, a lot of personal resources, but is entirely a foreigner and entirely not integrated into the local community community that relies on the beach for the sustenance of the economy. The entire economy in Amityville, this was shot on Martha's Vineyard, by the way, um, is based upon summer summer uh, income. So one shark can destroy the year of income for the people, but you still don't serve people for Schmarger's board. <laughs> So that that's or rather you still don't you you, you still don't you, you the moral is don't but but even though you're going to be tightening your belt don't be tempted to serve the shark up a smorgasbord of you know the neighbors kids other people's dogs all of that I hope that makes sense but right like I don't see and I don't see I see nothing I I see you know a, a very excellent job and as i said i've seen i've there's so many great she's written so much really fascinating material and um i presently don't have the wherewithal to take it apart wish i did and really wish i had a chance to read the the uh, madame lebowski article because i bet that's just amazing all this stuff about the root races but yeah right so ideology and archetype both important um Really understanding the true intention, not and not seeing Elizabeth also, I think, as a free free wheeler because, you know, uh, the issue, the allegation with surrounding um, diminished capacity. I think that's entirely unfair too. Um, to say that somehow it's okay to knock CUT because of the Alzheimer the specter of Alzheimer's and all of that. The, 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 her, you know, one can make an accurate evaluation of what's going on within the church based upon studying the, the teachings, which I have never seen to be anything other than lucid. Bomb shelters being the other point so bomb shelters, people talk about that too. Here's the thing, is that really, the ranch is really in a perpetual state of unfoldment. I heard mother once say that, and it actually, maybe it was one of the daughters even who related to me or who said it in a public forum that if someone felt injured, and it makes me emotional even to discuss it because I understand what, what she's doing when she says it, but if someone was injured by her. Um, that, you know, she would take full responsibility for that, which is what any good guru would say. Any good guru would say that exact thing. Why? Because it's easier, you know, I think at a certain point, if you're a holy person and if you've done as much as you can possibly, there's always Jesus who is suffering more than you do. Unless you are Jesus or Pope or Germain, um, you know, I, I, I will definitely help people understand the distinction between that. But all these good gurus who are, you know, mother was a Brahma guru and there are all these great Shiva gurus in the world too. Um, who's the Vishnu guru, right? That's, <laughs> that's the question. Um, and I'll let you figure that one out for yourselves. But, um, right, like, what she meant by that was she's willing to be the bad guy, not that she is the bad guy. There's a difference, you know, it, it's like when someone, as I said before, I think it's called false syllogism, too. I'll, I'll have to get you guys to that, but it's when a formula doesn't make sense logically. I'm not saying that, uh, this is not a criticism of of Aaron and of Aaron's work at all. It's not really about that. I know she understands that already. But I mean, I get, it, it, but it really because I've seen people around her, Aaron say support the notion that all these people needed therapy, and they tacitly do support that notion because of exposure to mother. And that's not 
what happened. It's not mother that caused the problem. Mother tried to help with the problem. Maybe the problem wasn't resolved. But don't turn around and blame the church for, for, solving prob for not solving problems that the church didn't initiate. So I do take exception to that when I hear, uh, isn't it sad that all these people need help in therapy now because of CUT? That's entirely inaccurate. I don't agree with anybody who, who makes that proposition. I don't. And I understand the alchemy, I think, well enough to, to be confident in saying that. Um, some people were seriously hurt, but not by the church. Not seriously hurt. I don't think it's possible. I, it, some people may have experienced certain forms of loss, and there might even uh, might you, there might even be valid civil claims. And in fact, I know that there are valid civil claims against CUT. But there are valid civil claims against even the the the, the most ethical organizations periodically, because people aren't helped timely, even though the leaders might be entirely willing to do the right thing. It's that help doesn't materialize in time, and it can be a problem from a civil standpoint. But is CUT the biggest culprit by no means? And I don't see, I don't even think the spotlight should be on CUT as the culprit. I think the spotlight should be on the White House and why it doesn't understand human rights law, and the White House and why it doesn't stop torture, and so on. And why it doesn't stop medical abuse and force and coercion in healthcare and all these things that these UN lawyers know about who aren't even towing a political agenda and said so these are survivors of abuse. They're not survivors of abuse by Elizabeth Clare Prophet. They're sur survivors of abuse by an abusive medical oligarchy. That's entirely different. So when people say, let's look at the problems at CUT, I think that it might be a segue into discussing the larger cultural problems, the broader cultural problems. But do I think that mother is the cause? I absolutely do not think that mother is the cause of the problem at all. But I can see where a guru, mother would say, I take it upon myself if I injured you. It is it is my responsibility if I if you felt injured by me or were. Um, but see, she could be entirely blameless and still say that. You know, that's a very Omega sort of Marian attack. You know, um, that's how I see it. It breaks my heart. I admire it, though. Um, but it is heartbreaking. I understand it. And I understand, I think Yogi Raj probably would say the same thing. If, um, and so on. But yeah, so my, my, my whole thing would be Give me a chance to read the angel paper, Aaron's angel paper. Give me a chance to read uh, Madame Blavatsky and to also develop my my Jameson um, expansion on, on the paper about Jaws, the film Jaws, um, and integrating archetype and ideology. I'd love to, to be the companion speaker, you know, the guy who gets up and does the the critical analysis, the, the political ideological analysis of CUT, because Aaron's already done such a good job with the archetype uh, component of it. So, um, right, and um, I, I think that, that, I think that's the natural evolution of this discussion. So I want to make that clear. I hope that this has been helpful. Um, I think that I, I, I was very scattershot today in my presentation. I'm really e eager to go in and clarify moments for you or to provide you with links and references um, and so on. Um, okay, that'll be it for now because I've taken up an hour of your time and I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna listen to this and make sure I'm not alienating too many people. But, and let me, let me give you props uh, to Aaron's work because she's done so much. Um, you go to Aaron Profit. It's actually eprofit.info. And what it will give you is a link to, it is eprofit.info, and it will give you a link to Mall, the, the lawsuit, which is actually, if you hit Elizabeth Clare Profit, the link at the top of that page, go down to Coercive Persuasion, and Gregory Mall. Coercive persuasion is actually at issue in my lawsuit against the locked ward 
facilities operating unconstitutionally in Maine. That exact term uh, is appears in my filed case, which has nothing to do with CUT. While I say it has nothing to do with CUT, these pro-psychiatric, pro-torture fascists are actually incredibly anti-religious. So um, the extent to which it's an entirely separate issue is not at all clear. But um, right, coercive persuasion. And then I'll give you a link, and then um, you will see actually her paper. And it might be that I can read her paper, although it's really long. I think it's like 150 pages or over 100 pages. Um, this isn't actual the lawsuit. What I'll do, Aaron, if you're listening, is I'll try to revisit the actual paper that you wrote, as opposed to looking at all the the filings. Wow. Okay, I'm looking at confessions and. What and part of the challenge is is navigating. some of the alleged attitudes towards the sexual difference. But I'll try to I'll I'll try to read the I'll try to read the paper. And, and why I say that is because you don't want the image of the guru to be deflated if you're as dedicated as I am. Um, and you do learn to see the fall in the guru as well, but part of the practice in guru yoga and bhakti yoga, which is what I practice with mother, is trying to preserve the notion that, not that she's perfect, but that she is the, the prime vehicle for all of the best information. And you do have to, that is a devotional practice. And you don't want to have the wind taken out of your sails. And periodically, people do it to me all the time, you guys, if anybody cares. it's I get, not all the time, but I mean, CUT is a lot better than the other big Christian churches in my experience. It needs to improve, though, when it comes to excluding groups of people. I entirely agree with that. Um, and anything to do with phobia is just not at all appropriate. And I can explain that in another recording, perhaps. It's not really a choice for a CUT-level institution to be making decisions about people's marriages and personal identity choices at all. It's totally inappropriate. But I think that CUT is probably more evolved than some of the other institutions out there. But to see it manifest itself on paper is painful, or can be. So I look away a little bit when I... Vicar of Christ. Padmasambhava came up with Guru Ma, right? Padmasambhava was is the sponsor, by the way, formally, of um, the Guruship. Vicar of Christ by beloved Jesus. I've seen recordings where I have early recordings of meetings after they made the transition from Mark being the leader to Mother and Elizabeth was really she face confronted opposition from the board who weren't initially ready to accept it. And she really put her foot down and said, I know that I'm the vicar of Christ. I know that this is my domain. Um, and uh, holy people, I think, reach a point where they know that they're towing a very valuable line that's, you know, critical, not only to their own personal evolution, but to the people around them as well. So I'll, I'll try to read this. I don't think I can get through this and the, um, actually, I'm going to save this right now so I don't lose track of it. And um, she also, Aaron also links you to the mall uh, lawsuit. So we're calling it coercion or conversion, or she did, Aaron did. This is her paper, Case Study in Religion and the Law.
CUT versus mall versus profit. So they did an odd thing, um, which is a bit awkward. Um, I don't see this too often in lawsuits, and I've had a fair degree of exposure to legal filings, um, is that they permitted it to be, I believe, unless, and Aaron can correct me, the CUT is suing mall for having sued profit. I'm not sure how they, how they did it in the court. But I saw the cover page to the actual filing, and I can tell you what it is by, by going there now. Um, if I can get the first one, table of contents. No, that's, well, that's not it. I have the chronological index of witnesses here. Direct, cross, redirect, recross. Okay, so let's see if I can see the caption. I'll tell you how they organized it. The caption is the top of the, a lawsuit, like the cover page of a lawsuit where you see the list of the defendants and it's organized. Usually it has a bunch of asterisks and a line in the middle of the page. It's, there's a specific format when you file. Um, right, and the way that they're doing it here, this is what I think is awkward because I don't even understand how to approach it. This is how it was filed in court. Uh, Court of Appeal of the State of California, 2nd Appellate District. So CUT Incorporated, a Montana corporation, as plaintiff, cross-defendant, and appellant, with ECP as cross-defendant and appellant, versus Gregory Mall. So this was the... You can get whatever you want from the lawsuit here. I, I see. I'm going to read the paper first and then see. Because I want to get to the meat of Aaron's information before scrolling through this. And as I said, I it's really next to impossible for me to read anything from here. But were I to undertake a read, it would be this coercion and conversion paper. And um, then there are, there's a letter history... newspaper clippings. Monroe Shearer, who is now Temple of the Presence, is was deposed. He's the head of Temple of the Presence. He was at CUT at the time. Okay, so I hope that everybody is able to work through the information to whatever extent they are able. I know Aaron's busy and I don't want to suggest that I'm able to curate this or even comment on the paper before reading it, but um, I can give you links to whatever it is that you need. I assume that there's no objection to my helping people um, find her information. You'll also find see if the blog, I have a couple postings on her blog, I believe, is brainwashing a thing. See, at this point, you, my, my recommendation is that you look at my case, and um, I'm in CUT, and um, I do have a case about this, and there's no mention of it here at all. It's not a private lawsuit, it actually needs to be, you know, we need to retrench, and it needs new representation. Um, so, it is timely to um, talk about both, I believe, um, to the extent that, you know, that all of that should occur now. I, you know, I'm a bit opposed to that because, as I said, this is a dangerous housing situation. And it's not really fair for me to have to cough up all this information about persuasive technology, brainwashing, torture, 
while I'm here. You know, I, at once I'm safe elsewhere <laughs> with, a, with a driver's license and private housing. That's all I need, not a mansion somewhere, but just private housing and a driver's license. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll discuss whatever you folks want to discuss. Oh, I see Rajneesh is mentioned here as well. Looks like one of the people in the... That actually, Rajneesh has mentioned other, under the book review. That Aaron wrote a book by Susan Palmer. I take up the question of whether the soup Aaron, according to Aaron, put a religion on trial and offer my opinion as to the lessons learned from the experience. I explain why I think Gregory had a case for intentional infliction of emotional distress, but not for fraud. And what I think of the outcome, I think this is Aaron. And actually, it's, it's the book. The paper I have is referred to as a book, Coercion or Conversion. It is self-published, quoting Aaron. I'm making the video and book available for free because I want the maximum number of people who have access to this project. If there is karma, then I think it is my karma to perform this evaluation and share it with those who need it. If not, then I feel a duty to those on both sides to speak my piece and be finished. I want to thank my sister, etc. I welcome thoughtful comments, and I hope that my work will help promote tolerance and understanding on all sides. Um, the book, video, and trial transcripts are available here, and that will link you back to the Gregory Malt suit, which is under that initial drop-down menu on the top page at eProfit, all one word, dot info. So you can also get there by doing eProfit.info forward slash Gregory dash Mall dash suit will take you to the location for that as well. So um, here's to archetype and ideology, guys. And um, more integration, a more integrated conversation on coercion, force and coercion, and multiple lawsuits regarding abuse. Okay, namaste. I hope this is helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, Jaws, man. I, I'd love to write. I'd love to do the update to Frederick Jameson if I can get funding for that, or someone can plot me down in a uh, trailer in Corwin Springs or in Bozeman um, and let me just go crazy with theory and getting stuff written. All right, I'll talk to everybody later. Namaste. Um, be in good touch with each other and take care of each other and. Um, don't forget to check out my other videos to like my page and um, to um, provide forms of support if you're able to do that. Okay, peace everybody. Bye-bye.